Welcome to Coronavirus in Texas, a virtual event series from the Texas Tribune. I'm Alana Rocha, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, while the Tribune has paused our in-person events, uh, we're moving the conversation here online with our ongoing series of virtual interviews. I'm here today with uh, J.B. Milliken, Chancellor of the University of Texas System, and we'll be discussing the effect of the current uh, coronavirus outbreak and the effects it's having on uh, higher education until about 12.45 this afternoon. Uh, Chancellor Milliken and I will be also going over questions submitted by our readers uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, first, we want to thank our sponsors for support supporting today's conversation. Of course, Ascension Seton, AT&T, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas, Educate Texas, Texas 2036, Texas Education Grantmakers Advocacy Coalition, and the University of Texas at Arlington. We also want to thank KXAN, Community Impact, and KPRC2 for their media support. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our events, they play no role in determining the content, panelist, or line of questioning. All right, let's get started. Chancellor Milliken uh, was named head of the University of Texas system in 2018. Previously, he served as chancellor of City University of New York, president of the University of Nebraska, and senior vice president at the University of California. Or Carolina, pardon me. Uh, Chancellor Milliken, thank you for uh, joining us. Thanks, Alana. Glad to be here. Uh, our conversation is timely, of course, for several reasons. I'm sure you saw this morning that we learned uh, Texas A&M Chancellor uh, John Sharp held a call with his 11 uh, campus presidents, uh, telling them that they'd be back on campus with in-person classes and that football and other sports would resume. Uh, I know we previously reported that you plan to make an announcement about fall in early June and just wondering if this ups your timeline or, or what you're looking at as far as that goes. So uh, we meet with our presidents uh, many times a week now, and I'm talking to presidents around the country almost every day. Um, and the conversation has changed over the last few weeks, and I would say most people are now convinced that the question isn't whether or not we'll open in the fall, it's how we'll open in the fall. Uh, and we'll do it in a way uh, that is safe and healthy for our students, our faculty, our staff, and visitors to the campus. So we will be watching and listening and working with the governor and his strike force uh, Harrison Keller, who's chairing a higher ed uh, work, uh, working group for that strike force. Uh, and we're meeting with our Board of Regents in a week. Um, this is a huge decision, and it's one that we're going to want to work closely with the leadership of the state on. But I think it's pretty clear that from talking to each of my presidents, from talking to board members, and from talking to colleagues around the country, that we will be open in the fall. Won't be entirely like last fall but it won't be like this spring either. What about when it comes to sports? Uh, do you foresee a, a football season there? Sports are uh, maybe the only thing above the chancellor's pay grade. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, it takes two to, to engage in sports. And these will be decisions that the NCAA and the conferences are involved in. Our athletic directors across the system are talking about this every day and working with their colleagues. Everybody wants to restart as much of that fabulous our college and university experience as we can. But we're going to do it in a way that's, that's safe and that's healthy and that protects our, uh, our community members, both on the campus and off. Speaking of the NCAA, I'm sure you saw the New York Times uh, this morning or the news yesterday that came out that the Board of Governors of the NCAA announced that it would support rule changes allowing athletes to earn money from the use of their names, images, and likeness. Um, such changes would take effect, providing everything goes as planned at the start of the 2021-22 academic year. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I think this, I think this is a positive uh, change, and uh, I'm, I'm supportive of, of the changes that they're, they're making. Um, and this is one thing, one thing that's probably not affected by coronavirus. Yeah, but I mean, the deals would have to come from third parties, so athletes wouldn't be considered university employees. Talk about kind of that dynamic. Um, so this is not an area that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And uh, um, so I'm going to let other people work this, this out. We've got great people working, working in each of our athletic departments, leading them, and, and presidents who are, are serve on the NCAA governing bodies. So, so um, you, know, you know, this is it's an adjustment. It's a change. It's a gradual one in, in terms of uh, how athletes are rewarded. Uh, but it's been in the, in the works for some time. 
Lots of questions about how fall semester will work. Uh, a woman named Bianca wrote in asking, asking how COVID-19 will affect admission and tuition for incoming freshmen, transfer, and current students. Yeah. So this is, we talk about these issues uh, uh, every day, and, uh, and we want as much of that you know, wonderful experience as we can have, but we also have to structure classes, gatherings, uh, to comply with health orders and to be as safe uh, as possible. So there'll be changes on the campus. Large, large gatherings uh, probably won't happen in the same way that, that they did last, last year or the years before. We're going to be looking at all kinds of questions regarding the financing of higher education and what we can do to make sure that our students are able to attend and persist. Uh, this summer, for instance, uh, we're online completely, just like the spring. And a number of our campuses have discounted tuition this summer for online students, just in part to encourage those students to continue to persist and to use this opportunity when in some cases the job market may be drying up a little bit for those students for summer employment to get some credits under their belt so that they can advance more quickly towards graduation. So there are a lot of factors here, um, but paramount is how we can continue the progress in Texas to educate more students and provide them that the access with the access they need and the opportunities to graduate. A couple of follow-ups there. I mean, you are such a big system. Do you see a one-size-fits-all, or if one campus say hasn't seen, or that area of the state hasn't seen any COVID-19 cases or not very many, will you maybe open up more? Do you foresee kind of a, a piecemeal approach? So there are a lot of. Uh, differences among our campuses, and some of them weigh into some budget decisions, probably as much as anything, and we can talk about that. Uh, but often it isn't one size fits all. Now, in this decision, uh, our campuses in the West are probably a week or two behind the campuses in the East in terms of the progress of COVID incidents. Uh, but at the end of the day, that probably will not affect decisions on fall opening. Okay. You talk about accessibility, you have a history of making that a priority as far as closing the achievement gaps and whatnot. We know from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, a, a survey that those without internet or computer access are already behind academically. How are you ensuring that, that students working remotely have access to both computers and internet to continue learning? Right, so this is one of the, uh, the, the big concerns that I have. I mean, there are, it's hard to overstate the impact of coronavirus and the, the illness, the unfortunate deaths that we've had, the, the, the complete disruption of the economy. But on the other hand, there are some, I think, some positives that will come out of this in the future. And one of them is an increasing comfort level with the use of technology in education, which is going to be one of the ways, I think, in Texas, with our population projected to maybe double over 30 years, that's going to be one of the ways that we accommodate a greatly increased number uh, of students. Now, that's the plus side. On the other side, there was a, a story by Ross Ramsey uh, a couple of weeks ago about the digital divide in Texas and how it impacts education and, other, uh, and, and work and other opportunities. So a third of Texas households still don't have access, uh, either because they lack the, the hardware or the connectivity uh, to uh, solid broadband uh, availability for computing. So that's uh, a significant issue that the state has. And I hope that any infrastructure investments that we're talking about coming out of this recognize that as we continue to use more and more technology in all areas of society, but particularly in education, we have to make sure that that digital divide uh, is narrowed significantly and then closed because we can't uh, we can't have a situation where the natural differences already in terms of wealth uh, and preparation of students are exacerbated by that. How is UT addressing those students who have expressed hardships in this area? Well, a number of ways. Um, the, the the Austin campus uh, immediately provided uh, 700 laptops to students who didn't have them at the beginning of the of the pivot to online. At some of our cam other campuses, we also provided laptops either as as donations or as loaners. At others, we set aside hotspots in the community and had uh, safely distanced computer labs for students to use. 
Each of the 14 campuses has established a, a private um, fundraising opportunity for relief, for emergency relief for students. And the, uh, the system has contributed to that to help match contributions that they uh, would get. Um, plus the CARES Act will help us uh, with this as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, yeah, real quick though, before we move on, uh, you know, from spring semester, summer, how will uh, commencements work? Do we know exactly how those are gonna play out? I know a lot of students really wanna walk across that stage, but what's the reality? Yeah, so we announced on the 17th of March based on the CDC recommendations and the uh, uh, talking with our board and our presidents that a number of things. One is that we were gonna go online 100%. And we did that within a week or two weeks time, depending on the institution. Uh, two, that we weren't gonna have uh, the kinds of commencement ceremonies in the spring uh, that we've had in the past. And that's a huge disappointment. I, I know as a father of a, uh, of a senior in college, that that's a huge disappointment. Uh, and I hope that we will have some rewarding virtual ceremonies this spring, and then we'll find other opportunities. Each of our campuses is talking about opportunities in the fall with their incoming commencements, I mean, uh, uh, convocations, or other opportunities later to bring these uh, graduates back so the graduates and their, and their families can celebrate. I will tell you that I just participated last week in the, uh, the uh, Archer program, which is a system-wide program, uh, just a terrific program where students work in Washington for a, a semester and they have a commencement. And we were able to have all 50 students on that and Congressman Archer and others participate. It was a fun, fun ceremony, although on Zoom. Um, <laughs> in a week or two, we're going to do the first graduation ceremony at uh, UT RGV's College, College of Medicine, the, their first one, their graduating class, and that'll be terrific. There are some opportunities um, that we have with regard to uh, events over this huge state uh, that we can participate in now uh, when it's virtual that, that we didn't have otherwise. I know it's not a substitute, and I would never suggest that, but, but there are some opportunities. You mentioned the CARES Act. Let's talk about the financial situation, the health of the UT system. Are Shannon Najmabadi listed off maybe some of your financial losses as a result of this, the cancellation of all spring athletics, millions of dollars in reimbursements for unused services like housing, parking, and voided study abroad programs. As of April 1, UT Austin had issued, what, $22 million worth of refunds for housing alone. Uh, but you also received uh, the system some $173 million almost from the CARES Act. Uh, UT has the second largest endowment in the country. I'm sure you saw the headlines last week with Harvard uh, being the largest endowment, uh, wanting to they face some backlash, so they're dedicating their entire allotment to financial aid. Uh, will UT follow suit, or do you know how that money will be spent? Um, I have some idea uh, how it will be spent. So there was about a billion dollars from the CARE Act that came to that will come eventually to Texas higher education institutions. And the UT system, about a little over 170 million of that. Half of that funding will be used for emergency grants to students. And that's underway now. Uh, the Department of Education is still issuing some guidelines and we'll wait for those so that we'll be sure we spend the money as Congress and the department intends. But at each of our institutions, we have plans developed now to issue payments to students uh, immediately so that those in the greatest financial need will get some assistance right now. So that's half the money we'll get. That's 80, $86 uh, million. The second half will come for institutional purposes, and that hasn't been determined yet. There's no, well, there isn't complete guidance, I don't believe, from the Department of Education yet. And we'll be talking to our Board of Regents about how each of our institutions will use that half of the, of the funding. But you mentioned uh, the reimbursements. That's another thing that we announced on the 17th of March, early on in this process, that we were going to refund the major auxiliary expenses, residence halls, dining, parking, uh, that students weren't allowed to use because they weren't allowed to return to, uh, to campus. Now, if you take UT Austin, for example, um, they've already spent considerably more in terms of refunds than they will be eligible to receive in the institutional funds from the CARES Act. So it, it, we're not going to come out ahead because of the CARES Act. It is a welcome assistance. 
but uh, it, it's not going to uh, put any of our institutions back on uh, their expectations for their budget this year. We know much of uh, your endowment, of course, is, is fulfilled by, um, you know, they call it the oil fund or obviously the oil production. With those numbers hurting, how does that affect uh, your bottom line overall? Well, I, I'll, I will, I'll say something about that, but if I can go back just one minute uh, okay. in regard to your last question, I don't think I answered it entirely. The, the endowments that, that, that Harvard got received a lot of attention. So um, a couple of those institutions have, have returned them. You know, one thing I think is important for people to recognize is that the, the, the UT system and the, the endowment we have, which is a wonderful asset, we have 240,000 uh, students, and uh, uh, the uh, funds per capita or endowment per capita, which is one way of looking at this, is about 160,000 in our system. It's about 1.6 million at the institutions with the largest endowments in, in the country. If you take Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, all the Pell Grant students they have is about four or 5,000. It's 80,000 at the University of Texas system. So we're serving a different population. I think a population that the Congress and the administration uh, is trying to provide relief to. And believe me, those funds will be well used and those students who benefit from them will be, be deserving. With regard to the, um, the permanent university fund, the, uh, the lands, the university lands in uh, the Permian Basin that uh, serve to support the University of Texas system and uh, Texas A&M University. It's a great resource, a terrific resource, always been a, a true advantage uh, for Texas, but it will be affected. And not just by COVID, of course, but by what's been going on uh, in the oil industry over the past month. That will be a significant impact. Uh, we estimate that the University Lands Division, which last year transferred over a billion dollars to uh, the university systems for management of its funds, will transfer less than half of that amount next year. So it will be a significant impact uh, on our university system and on Texas A&M. Speaking of or staying with the financial uh, questioning, of course, football and sports is a huge moneymaker for universities. I'm a uh, University of Florida Gator, so I know the importance of uh, you know college sports and what it does for universities. I mean, are you taking that moneymaker, if you will, into account when uh, deciding exactly how and if uh, football will return in the fall? We're just getting a lot of audience questions, uh, people interested in that aspect of uh, fall semester. Yeah. Well, of, of course, it's hugely important. And this is something that there's great variability across our eight academic in institutions. And last time I checked, our six health-related institutions weren't fielding much of a football team. But the And UT Austin, of course, is one of the most profitable uh, athletic enterprises in the country. And of course, that's important, but it's not. It's nowhere near as important as the health and safety of our students and our visitors uh, to our institutions. So um, while we are thinking about all the time, all the dimensions of the budget uh, impacts on the university system, uh, we continue uh, to have paramount the concern with uh, health and safety. Are you looking then to get creative? And I know we've talked about or we've heard about a lot of sports holding the sports without audiences or without people in the stadium. It's kind of hard to imagine, but that's the times it seems we're living in. Well, I heard the other day that Major League Baseball uh, is talking about that. And I know soccer is talking about it, professional soccer. And uh, believe me, uh, the athletic directors and coaches, as well as the presidents and the people on my team are thinking every day about every possible permutation of how we will reopen, how quickly we will reopen, and how completely we will reopen. But I can uh, assure uh, everyone that this is a, uh, an issue of enormous importance to us. And we know how important it is to, to our students and the university community and to all Texans. Yeah, Longhorns worldwide will be watching, I'm sure. Hey. Um, 
you mentioned UT Austin, of course, among your meetings, I'm sure, mm -hmm. is uh, planning for the new leadership there. We know Greg Fenvis is leaving for Emory University. What is that process like and, and what are you looking at there? Well, so we have actually three uh, campuses now with interim uh, leadership, UT Austin, the most recent, but also uh, UT Arlington and UT Medical Branch. Um, and so we've already launched a search at the medical branch, but we put it on a bit of a pause right now uh, in the last few weeks because everyone is focused, not just here, but across the country. So in these searches, we want to make sure that we get the attention of the best candidates everywhere and that we're able to attract them to, to our institutions at Texas. So um, we're going to do this in a way uh, and according to a timetable that allows us uh, to do that. So we won't be out uh, this week looking for uh, candidates for presidencies at any of our institutions. We're going to take a little bit of a breather right now and allow our folks and the folks who would be candidates from around the country to devote their total attention to what's going on at their institutions because of the impact of COVID. Of course, that new uh, president will be overseeing a, a new model of education. Uh, Daniel asks, do you believe that brick and mortar education will be permanently adjusted to online uh, going forward? Well, you know, so I mentioned that there are, uh, you know, possibly some silver linings or some opportunities here. And I do think that one of them is um, that this is one of, I think, the disruptive moments in higher education that has been promised for 20 years or predicted and it, it really hasn't happened in a broad way. I do think this is the beginning of a, of a different way of thinking about it because of necessity. And so the fall, as we talked about, will look different than, than last fall. I do believe that now we have had every faculty member engaged in some way in remote teaching and every student engaged in it. That's a huge change. We will find out much more about what works well and what doesn't work well and people are comfortable with. So that'll be a that'll be a change. We've also found out by necessity, along with everyone else, that certain kinds of remote working for employees uh, is much more productive maybe than we had thought it would be. And so I think we'll see an impact not just in higher education, but in all organizations where, you know, our real estate footprint may look a little different uh, in the future. One of the issues that universities have grappled with for ages is the space utilization of its facilities. These are large, expensive uh, facilities, and, um, and often uh, at some universities, they aren't used as uh, extensively as they could be. Well, I think when we come back in the fall and start talking about social uh, distancing, uh, we're going to be spreading people out over more time and using facilities differently. And that'll have some, I think, benefits for us in the future as we are looking to accommodate a much larger number of Texans. The state relaxed its rules on telemedicine, uh, which has been enormously helpful for our institutions and others to be able to uh, see patients around the state who couldn't travel. And I think that's, as we get more comfortable with that, and the quality of that and, and uh, the, the regulators understand it and are comfortable with the quality, that's another uh, benefit that we will see uh, come out of this. What about testing? A lot of uh, what's been written and, and proven in other states and other countries is that the key to reopening or, or relaxing uh, rules is just access to testing. Can you tell me how many employees or staff there at UT and the UT system have been tested and kind of what levels you want to see um, ahead of a fall decision? Well, I can't give you a number on the number of people that have been tested now because tests are largely reserved for people who have some symptoms or who have some reason otherwise to have a test because of their work. And our employees, for the most part, are almost entirely working from, from home now. Um, now, we do a lot of the testing. I mean, at uh, UTMB, for instance, they can do 1,800 tests uh, a day. 
and probably six or seven, eight of our institutions are doing tests right now, some among the major testers in their community. So that's going to be important. Um, and we're going to continue uh, to learn between now and the fall about what we need uh, to do. But we, we do think uh, right now we know that businesses ha that have opened, manufacturing entities that have opened in other places, for instance, because their employees have to be present to do their work. They have temperature tests when they come into the plant. Uh, if they're symptomatic, then they're tested again. And if they have any symptoms, they're isolated. Um, people uh, right now who are working in Texas, uh, who are essential workers, uh, they have their temperature checked. There are rules in the buildings about isolation. They're asked a series of questions about you know, where they've been uh, so that we, they can be assessing whether or not there's risk of, uh, of infection. We can't control what everyone does when they're off campus. Uh, but we can do everything in our power to make sure that we are not um, doing anything that uh, would possibly spread uh, infection uh, from our campus outside of it or within the campus. Of course, your other role in this, and you alluded to it, uh, is you're the number one healthcare worker educator uh, in the state, uh, preparing the people on the front lines who are fighting this pandemic. What has that aspect of the UT system looked like during this time? So I have had started having calls in mid-March about every other day with the academic presidents and then the health presidents alternating. And it's a very different kinds of conversations, as you could imagine. I mean, what the health presidents were concerned with immediately was how they uh, free up hospital capacity for COVID patients. And so they immediately, uh, under the governor's uh, orders and in uh, conjunction with every other hospital in the, in the state, uh, started eliminating uh, elective or non-COVID related uh, surgery. So um, that had an enormous financial impact on us, estimated between 10 and $15 million a day of lost revenue, maybe half a billion to a billion in lost revenue for the year when we finish this up. The recent relaxation by Governor Abbott uh, is, is welcome and I think appropriate under the circumstances given how many COVID patients Texas has seen. So we're still maintaining some capacity, but at each of our institutions, we've now started doing other surgeries, which while referred to as elective, uh, in some cases are, uh, can be urgent um, you know, you're talking about cancer surgery, heart surgery, other issues where um, we need to take care of the whole population. And going forward, we need to have the protections in place, the protocols in place, the testing in place to be able to do both things at once, to be able to maintain capacity for COVID, which we're doing now, but also uh, maintain the ability to treat uh, other uh, Texans. And at the same time, we've continued to educate uh, students. Some of our institutions have accelerated their graduation for health professionals like MDs so that they could be out, those who wanted to be uh, in the front lines working earlier. That's hugely important. But I think one of the things that people will see out of this is just how important our institutions like the University of Texas institutions are to the state. You know, we train over half the residents uh, in the state, and it's it's essential that we continue to operate at at least the speed we're doing now, so that we can continue to provide the healthcare that Texans need in the future. On the research end, I uh, had the chance to talk with Jason McClellan at UT Austin in the McClellan Lab. Uh, at the start of this, I got some flack because I think we shook hands in the video, uh, and that was before uh, you know the times of social distancing and everything else. But uh, you know, just about their breakthrough and what they did to to map a part, a key part of the virus, to be able to accelerate vaccine development and sharing that information with labs around the world. Uh, talk about what what's afoot there. I know he said they're not working on a vaccine specifically, but looking at other treatments, antibodies, and things like that. So there are a whole bunch of different kinds of research projects. First of all, we shut down most non-COVID related research at our institutions just to make sure that we uh, were keeping people safe. So there's been uh, pretty much a lockdown on much of that. But there are, I, 
think last count over 130 different research projects going on across the system with regard to uh, vaccines uh, and treatments, different kinds of uh, treatments. Uh, there's a lot of modeling going on, including at uh, UT Austin, which is being used nationally so that we can uh, get the public health information we need as quickly as we need it. And so that uh, uh, public uh, officials can act on it. But I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased and I believe that some of our faculty who are engaged in this COVID research right now, I mean, we all hope for a vaccine as early as possible. And we all hope and have recently seen some promising results relating to treatments. But I, I think we'll be very much involved in that. We'll have researchers who are on the cutting edge of, uh, of that work and in doing the clinical trials to uh, support its eventual approval. Do you foresee a uh, treatment or a, uh, I guess a widespread accepted treatment in the scientific world ahead of fall semester? I, the governor's kind of expressed it so much uh, when asked about whether or not kids will be returning in K through 12 here. Yeah, well, we're we're all hopeful about that, and as I said in the in the last week, we've seen some very positive news uh, about treatment, and we continue to hear about uh, new ideas for treatments that are being uh, pursued by drug companies and, uh, and and universities. So we're all hopeful for that, and it's likely that a treatment will uh, be developed. Uh, that will serve a large number of, the, of members of the population before a vaccine will be uh, approved. So that'll be an important next step in, in our ability to return to what we have thought of as completely normal. You mentioned that much of the uh, non-COVID research has been uh, shut down just for, for safety reasons, but I guess who is left on campus? If we were to drive uh, here in Austin on the drag, or, or who would we see uh, driving through campus? Hopefully very few people, um, but that'll change. I mean, first of all, we were uh, deemed an essential service, an essential operation uh, from the beginning, uh, but also encouraged by the governor uh, and the CDC and others to work home, work from home when possible. So that was our, our guidance. So there are, there are security uh, professionals, there are uh, facilities professionals. Um, there are IT infrastructure people there. Uh, we still have some students on our campuses because on the 17th of, of March, when we announced that we would uh, close all university residences to students, except for those who had no reasonable alternative. And so at our campuses that have uh, residential students, each of those has some level of students there now who, for one reason or another, they might have been international students who couldn't return home. They might have been foster youth uh, who had left their foster homes and didn't have uh, a place to return. So we have continued to accommodate those students in a way that is safe, uh, socially distant. We provided meals in a safe way, that kind of thing. So there's, there is still some activity on every campus. And you will begin to see now with the relaxation in the state's guidelines from the strike force and the governor that we will be moving people back over time in a careful and gradual way uh, and continuing to follow the, uh, all the guidance that's uh, available to us. We have a question from a viewer, uh, a guy named Chris asks, economic and campus disruptions might push bachelor bound students uh, to community colleges in the fall, how can transfer partnerships be strengthened? Is that something that's being considered? So I'm on a national uh, task force on strengthening uh, the transfer processes across the country. I, I am a huge believer in this. I believe it's, it is one of the ways that we are going to serve Texas in the future. If our population doubles and the number of college going or college eligible students uh, doubles, we can't accommodate them today, and we're not going to replicate the existing structure. We're not going to double it uh, in size. We will not. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, I, I'll give this away. We're not going to have 28 institutions of the University uh, of Texas system then, because the population doubles. We're going to have to do a lot of things differently. We have to have more early high school, um, whether it's dual credit or uh, early college or um, uh, or AP, so that people are getting more credits in high school. And we're going to have much better articulation between community colleges uh, and universities. Now, I don't, it's too soon to see what the impact will be on enrollments this summer and this fall. 
we're already looking across the university system, and I know some other Texas institutions are experiencing the same thing, where enrollment's actually going to be up this summer. Uh, and we don't know yet what fall will look like. Uh, but uh, I saw some recent polling that said 30% of millennials asked thought they would have to go back to school to retool for the economy coming out of the COVID pandemic. So I don't think there's going to be any diminution of, uh, of demand on college. Um, I do think that we'll see more community college enrollments in large part because of disruption in the economy, not necessarily traditional student populations. And whenever we have seen a recession in this country, we have seen college enrollment and particularly community college enrollment go up. So I think we may see that natural uh, natural trend where people may be out of a job, may be furloughed or, or laid off, and they are using that time to advance their skills. Or we're just going to see an increasing amount of retooling in the economy where workers believe that, and I think rightly, that there are going to be some changes in the economy with artificial intelligence and robotics uh, that, that they need to uh, retool and reskill to be prepared for a better job. You mentioned fall enrollment and uh, Lewis asks, will full football be permitted if students are now not allowed on campus in fall? Will well, one that, hinge on the other? Yeah, I, I, that's not exactly an either or a question. I mean, it, you know, things may be different. Things will be different even when students are on campus. So we can't, it's too early to, uh, to say uh, on that. And we're, and I think we, we talked about this. We all want to see, football <laughs> and everything and all the other stuff that comes with it. But we're going to do all, all these decisions will be made in a way to keep people safe. I mean, how, how many, uh, what percentage would you say are of your discussions are about football right now? I mean, obviously there are many important issues you're tackling here at the head of the system, but I guess how much of that uh, consumes your conversations? Well, my conversations, very little. My presidents, President Fembase, of course, uh, other presidents who have football uh, teams and programs, considerably more of theirs and their athletic directors are thinking of very little else right now. Uh, Nicole asks with a percentage of 2020 freshmen possibly deferring their start until fall of 2021, how will that impact fall 2021 acceptances or of applicants? So this is a conversation that we're having with our presidents and that every institution across the country is thinking about. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with a, a few presidents of national universities where uh, they raised the issue uh, about uh, limiting uh, or precluding uh, deferrals because of the impact it could have in 2021. Now, I don't know that anybody here is at that place yet, but that's uh, something we're going to have to to think about uh, how that will affect the uh, the next year's class. It's one of the reasons that um, most institutions are uh, at the point of thinking about not whether they will open in the fall, but how to open in the fall and how we can provide uh, the best possible experience, but still keeping people safe. And, and, and we focus a lot on the students uh, and we know that there um, is often less of an impact with COVID with this, with the people in that typical age demographic. Uh, but we have a lot of faculty and staff who aren't in that demographic. And we have a lot of visitors uh, to our campuses, to not just our sporting events, but our museums, our libraries, uh, other uh, just on campus. And we need to be thinking about all those populations and how we're going to structure this to, to keep them safe. One question from Prentice, he asks, what will the UT system do, obviously a lot of people at the table in these decision making, if there's political pressure to open up more quickly than medical experts and epidemiologists believe is prudent? So I don't really have a concern uh, about that um, because I know, you know the governor has set up a, a strike force on reopening and there are four physicians and one of them is uh, Dr. John Zerwas, who's the executive vice chancellor for uh, the university system. I have great confidence in the, uh, the ability of that team of medical professionals. Also uh, on, on our team, David Lakey, former health commissioner for the state, is, another, is a vice chancellor. And so we are getting 
the best information every day, I believe, that's available uh, for our decision makers at the administrative level and for our board. But I also believe the governor is getting better information every day and uh, than I am. Uh, and he is uh, committed, has said publicly, uh, and I've seen the evidence of this through the work of this strike force and the, particularly the team of, of physicians that's supporting it, that these decisions are going to be made based on the, on the science. They're going to permit uh, some flexibility at the local level and the institutional level. You know, we, we were given directives early on and then given the flexibility to manage that, which we've done at the institutional level. And I think we've done it very successfully. And I, I think that I look forward to that continuing. I have no reason to think it won't. Uh, final question. Uh, my curiosity, prior to being at UT, you were, of course, in New York, had seen severe devastation from this uh, disease, from COVID-19. How have you been talking to former colleagues uh, or and how they've responded, how has that shaped your approach to managing this here at UT? Yeah, well, um, you know, it, it, what's happened in New York is just incredibly, uh, incredibly unfortunate and uh, just a, a catastrophe. And I, I talked to my former colleagues there uh, quite a bit and, of course, followed the uh, the news from there, I've lost a few former colleagues, some distinguished faculty members at, at the City University uh, to COVID. And so it has really kind of brought home uh, to me what happens if uh, you don't uh, take every precaution possible uh, that's reasonable. You don't listen to the scientific and, and medical advice. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying that we had a little bit of a, an advantage by having uh, several weeks of delay where uh, Governor Abbott and others could get the best teams around them and make the, uh, the best decisions for the state. And I think that's been happening. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I sympathize, empathize, um, uh, mourn in some cases, uh, my friends, uh, with my friends in New York, um, and I hope that they are uh, coming out of this, but they've been hit, hit much harder uh, than anyone else. And um, it's, it's been a, a very, very difficult time there. You sounds like you obviously have them in mind in approaching this matter here at UT, very different state than New York. As you said, we had time uh, watching it play out on the coast before it got here. Right, right. But, but you know, the, these pandemics are, are global. And, um, you know, uh, we know that with something like uh, COVID, we are susceptible to it and it will come. It's how well we prepare for it, we manage for it. Uh, we, as they say, flatten the curve and an ability so it doesn't overwhelm our healthcare system, which I believe we have done in Texas. We have not overwhelmed the system. And now we are ramping up our healthcare systems to treat other patients. So, we're just in a much better place and we're very fortunate uh, because of that. And we've taken advantage of it. You have a lot of confidence. It sounds like in the, in the current uh, task force for coronavirus, you talk about flattening the curve, but with easing of restrictions uh, starting tomorrow, are you nervous at all about the impact it could have on the health system here in Texas? Well, you know, we, we have to, we can't continue to have a lockdown on, society and the economy and life that that won't work and i don't think anybody uh, agrees with that we have to find the right rhythm here we have to find uh over time the right level of activity and how we continue uh to make sure that we aren't having uh, a resurge of the uh, covid and that when we do have some additional cases we manage them uh, appropriately but from all evidence that i have this is being very thoughtfully um, uh, approached. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of unknowns with this. We are going to keep uh, working on this every day. And as we talked about before, we hope that there's a, a treatment uh, coming soon uh, and a vaccine on an accelerated uh, schedule. Until that's done, until we have a, an effective treatment, uh, and then eventually a vaccine, we are going to have to take things a, a step at a time and be managing this uh, every day. 
Chancellor, we'll have to have that as the last word. It is now 1245 on the dot. We thank you all for so much for tuning in. And of course, thank you to uh, Chancellor Milliken for joining us. Uh, thanks to everyone who supported today's event. To help us continue hosting events like this one, you can donate to our nonprofit newsroom at texastribune.org slash give.